Hello, ma'am. Your mic is mute. Your mic is mute. Yeah, good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I can see Rajesh there. Yeah. Hi, Rajesh. Hi, ma'am. Hi, hi. I can see some people here. I'm familiar with. Yeah. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. Okay. I'm, I hope I'm not late. Uh, no, 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 okay. not at all. I'll, I'll wait. We will wait for two, three minutes. Yeah, sure, sure, sir. Just let me know when I should be on. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So yesterday it was a very long session, is it? Because yeah, yeah. Audio, yeah, it went on till eight thirty-nine. I think is that it? Is that so? Uh, no, Jerem sir was actually talking about art and literature. So, he yeah. himself being, a, being a painter was very enthusiastic to present, uh, you know, the painting movement. So he, the must, he, he must have used visuals, right? I yes. know. Yes. We're all familiar with Jerem sir's presentation. Uh, uh -huh. We all grew up watching <laughs> that, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah literally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we had to present the major movements, you know, the modernist movements. Yeah, so, yeah, right, right. Is this the last uh, one? Is this mine? Is the last presentation? No, no. So no. We have another session tomorrow. You have a session tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sanjay Mukherjee from Saurashtra University. Ah, yes, of course. Yeah, I did see that. Yes, yes, yeah. Rajesh? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Shall, shall we? we start? Yeah. Can, shall we? Yeah. Let us. Uh, ma'am? Janaki, ma'am? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm here. Yeah. 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 So, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Rajesh James. I'm part of the department. Uh, I'm here to welcome Dr. Janaki Sridharan, Professor. Department of English, University of uh, Calicut. 
to this lecture series which is conducted as part of an induction program organized for the students of uh, English Sacred Heart College, Sevra. Professor Janaki is an uh, accomplished academician, prolific writer and a passionate reader. Uh, as her blog says, she loves uh, poetry, mythology, folk tales, theater and uh, films. Um, I was lucky enough to be her student when I was doing uh, my PhD in uh, Calicut University. And she is such a supportive person. Uh, and also, uh, there was no compromise with the academics. Right, as students, we used to play with the, the study part. But uh, she was very strict, but very uh, supportive, encouraging person. Right, She completed her uh, PhD from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. And uh, just like every other JNU White, uh, as an academic, her theoretical positions are very bold. And uh, uh, she is very vocal about subjects like feminism, gender equality, media, culture, so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have a personal memory also to cherish. Uh, in fact, she is a fellow traveler uh, in my journey as a filmmaker. And we used to meet almost every year on the steps of Kala Academy. Ma'am, I hope you remember those long queues, long queues. Oh, yes, and, yes, uh, yeah. yes. Our journey for the tickets, etc. Right. So, uh, besides that, uh, she has written and published extensively uh, in reputed journals, and in fact, you could see some samples of her writing in the internet, internet on film, on uh, published books, or reviews of certain, uh, you know, international books, etc. And uh, she's also an accomplished translator. And uh, most importantly, she handles a column in uh, Sankhadita, a uh, feminist magazine uh, in Kerala. Right? I think these days they have made it into a digital uh, version yes. also. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. It's very important for uh, the budding scholars, right? So uh, on, the, on behalf of the department and college, uh, uh, thank you so much for, for coming here and uh, for being part of this uh, lecture series. I welcome you in the name of uh, uh, you know, HOD, Johnson Sir, and all other faculty members, as well as in the name of the college. Welcome, yeah. ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh, so much. Okay. okay. So, uh, shall uh, I... I also... Uh, yeah, one minute, ma'am. I also yeah, welcome yeah. all the all the participants, uh, you know, in one word. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, we're all going to have a very good, uh, maybe, uh, what do you call, rewarding as well as engaging session. So now over to uh, Professor Janagi. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rajesh, for those very kind and warm words of welcome. Uh, of course, as you mentioned, uh, we will really miss that uh, meeting at the film festivals uh, thanks to COVID. I don't know how often we are going to meet in future, because this seems to be online, seems to be the only meeting place for all of us. Uh, I hope, before I begin uh, formally, I hope I am visible and I hope I am audible. Yes? Yes, ma'am. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, good evening to one and all. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, particularly uh, in the company of all those students uh, who, even in these bleak and dismal times, are all rearing to go into their PG course in English language and literature. Now, you have been listening to some very interesting topics in the last couple of days, and I'm sure you're all enthused about doing your MA. Uh, but the topic that has been assigned to me, which is interdisciplinarity in literature, it has been a, an area of very heavy theoretical engagements in the recent times, and it continues to be very intensely debated. Uh, even when interdisciplinarity has gained popularity in pol policy, practice, teaching, and research circles. Uh, you can see that despite all the skepticism that is associated with this area, it has also gained very strong moral overtones with arguments for why interdisciplinarity is both desirable and inevitable. Now, uh, you, may, uh, you might have uh, felt a little uh, intimidated by that kind of an introduction, but I promise. I don't think I'm going to burrow too deeply into the nitty gritty of those debates, speculations, and contentions, because the audience are primarily students who are all eagerly waiting at the threshold of their 
uh, PG course, and I don't want you uh, want you to feel you know kind of intimidated. Uh, but w one thing you must clearly uh, remember and keep in mind is that today, uh, even our new education policy in India talks about interdisciplinarity. And there have been, we have moved from inter to intradisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, and deep disciplinarity. Well, I'm not going into the subtleties and nuances of these differences because you will come to know them by and by. And the more curious I mean, you will definitely pursue that on your own. But one thing we need to keep in mind while talking about interdisciplinarity is it is definitely linked to disciplinarity. Discipline, the word discipline. Disciplines, as you know, are not natural formations. They are historically constructed. Disciplinary boundaries were an integral part of the university system. And it involved a professionalization of different knowledge systems. Now, origins of disciplines, the very notion of discipline, discipline of physics, discipline of English, this classification into different disciplines, this classification or the origins of this classification, when you look at the history of our university system, we realize that they vary from country to country, from region to region, from continent to continent. It is said that uh, some people contend that uh, this has been there from the, since the inception of Western thought. Some people say that in England, the birth of the discipline uh, was sometime they peg it in the middle of the 19th century. In the US, sometime between 1870 and 1900. In India, the trajectory would be even more different. So what I'm trying to say is that there is no uniformity in, in terms of its origins, in terms of the approaches that people have towards interdisciplinarity, uh, in terms of the positions that people have regarding its consequences. But I would, so what, I'm, what am I trying to talk to you today? What, I, what do I plan to talk to you about? Are some basic shifts and changes that have taken place in the departments of English world over, and particularly in India and maybe in Kerala also in the last two decades. Those changes have been the result of a redefinition of what we mean by literature, its relationship with other disciplines, its possibilities and relevance in our everyday life, in this society and on this planet. No longer do we in the English departments feel euphoric that we can write and communicate in a particular language like a native speaker. No longer do we feel happy only with the high marks we gather and uh, the fellowships we were obtained to higher institutions of excellence to do research. No longer are we complacent that we can read a poem and understand what we think its meaning is. No longer are many of us just happy with occupying high positions in many institutions. All these are, of course, definitely sources of satisfaction. But there is also a strong ethical responsibility that powers the kind of knowledge production and skill dissemination which raises very important questions. The interdisciplinary movement with the literary studies has been motivated by certain fundamental ethical questions thus raised as to how do these departments connect and relate to the social experiences priorities and desires of the learners, learners being you students. How do you relate to the subjects, the papers you are being taught in an English literary syllabus? Do you feel connected or do you feel alienated? These were very strong questions that came up in the late 80s and the 90s in many of the English classrooms all over India. And the English teachers had to confront them. A learner-centered pedagogical shift has been one of the prime principles at the core of this interdisciplinary thrust. But I must caution you that not everyone views this new enthusiasm for interdisciplinarity in a very optimistic manner. For instance, you have this highly eloquent scholar called Dr. Robert Pippin. He's accessible on YouTube. You can easily access his lecture on interdisciplinarity. He's a distinguished professor at the Committee on Social Thought in the University of Chicago. 
And in his talk, uh, I think it was uh, delivered sometime, a few, a couple of years back, he speaks about the condition in the American, you know, American university system. And he says, in America, this interdisciplinarity was an expression of a deep crisis in the American university system. And he is also very skeptical about this uh, drive for uh, you know, interdisciplinarity because he says it is a part of an increasing corporatization of education in the US. That's why I said it is very situated, this interdisciplinarity and the entire discourse around it varies from place to place. So in America, it is tempered, the enthusiasm is tempered with a reasonable measure of skepticism and reservation. So according to Dr. Pitten, it is uh, actually a part of the corporatization of education and also a part of a drive to eliminate many staff positions. Many teachers were losing their jobs in inter interdisciplinarity when waves of interdisciplinarity came surging into the departments. At the same time, there are voices which welcome the growth of inter interdisciplinar interdisciplinarity. For instance, in UK, uh, actually, they, they, uh, there is an air of, uh, you know, victory or rather optimism when they consider interdisciplinarity as a reaction to formalism. You are all uh, students of literature and I'm sure at least some of you, at least I think most of you have come after doing your UG in English language and literature. And at some point in your undergraduation, you must have confronted or come across a movement called formalism in literary theory. And you, you also know what, what it means to be a formalist to a certain extent. This was considered to be a reaction. And why was that good? And why was that welcomed? That will come to a little bit later. Now, one thing that you have to, one, uh, what these uh, practitioners of inter interdisciplinarity in UK keep underlining is that it is more than a blending of two disciplines. In one particular paper you write or study, it is actually a reimagining of the very physical structure of a university system, with its different departments working in isolation. You know, uh, long back in the early 80s, when I was doing my BA uh, in a college very near you, uh, which was St. Teresa's College, and I think almost all colleges follow the same system. In this, people in the English department. Uh, did not have a dialogue with those in the physics or the history department as such. Since we all these departments, of course, we met, we talked, we did entertainment programs together, but on the level of academics, there was no give and take going on. So almost all the work departments academically were working in isolation. There weren't any papers that we took from the history department. But very soon as I went on to do my MA in Jawaharlal Nehru University, there was this interdisciplinarity had already started coming into India at that time. And we were asked in our third and fourth semesters to walk up to the sociology department, to the history department, to see what were the possible courses that we could take as electives. So then it is a notion, in the notion of electives that you find interdisciplinarity coming in into the Indian university system. You would have noticed in your syllabus also, there are a series of electives. I'm sure you've all seen the syllabus. Now, the birth, and uh, again, coming back to UK, you find that there was a journal called Victorian Studies. And they consider the birth of this journal as a very important moment, a very pivotal moment in the birth of interdisciplinarity in their academia. Interdisciplinarity meant that we could no longer study a literary text in isolation. It was a reaction to an understanding of both history and literature in its most restricted sense. I'll come back to that point a little later. But before that, there's a couple of other things that we need to thresh out. So, and this interdisciplinary thrust has prompted the teachers and framers of the syllabus to wake up to the new voices, new impulses of expression, thoughts, and ideas around our milieu, which ask us to constantly reshape our topics and methods of learning. Actually, I would like to cite an example from my own experience, personal experience, personal academic experience. When almost 10 years back, we in Calicut University decided to offer a course on literature of the marginalized. I was one of the framers of the syllabus. And uh, what was interesting, and I'm sure almost all of you have done it in 
in some form or the other, the, the voices of the marginalized. But this was 10 years back, mind you. This paper brought on one platform the voices of race, caste, gender, sexuality, ecology, and tribal subjectivities. We try to see connections and patterns in the subjectivities and writings that emerge from the locations of marginality in different cultures. While the students were already a little familiar with the issues of race and caste in their UG syllabi, queer writing was a little unfamiliar terrain. You know, the voices of lesbian, gay, uh, transgender narratives. So the candid or even sex workers narratives, we had Nalini Jamila's autobiography also in that particular paper. So the such candid narratives of different sexualities or minority sexualities were shocking to them, which they overcame gradually. And the initial sense of outrage gave way to discovery and empathetic understanding. And some of them even were bold enough to go back home and share their recent, recently acquired knowledge with their parents. And one, one day, yeah. And one girl came back to me the next day and said, "Hello, Is that a yeah, yeah ma'am, uh, we can't see you properly. You know, only half oh. of your face. Yeah. Okay, can you see me now? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ah, yes, can you? Fine. Is yeah. it okay? Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, OK, because I was trying to make my paper a little bit more visible to me. That's why. Anyway, that's all right. Uh, can I continue? Is it OK now? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, OK. Uh, uh, so what I was trying to say was that uh, um, uh, there was a, a sense of outrage among the students in the beginning. And slowly, they overcame that, overcame their inhibitions and all that. And they came to terms with these new uh, or different kinds of, uh, 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 you know, orientations, uh, sexual orientations that the people are bound to have. Uh, and uh, they went and shared this with their parents. And one mother was totally scandalized, not because she talked about this, you know, different kind of uh, physical experiences, but uh, she was very upset. This was being done in the English language and depart literature department. Uh, she came back to me and said, my mother is very upset. And she says, I thought you were learning English language and literature. What are you talking about? So what is important here is that interdisciplinarity was working within the department. And that caused all these problems. Because she could not. I'm not blaming the mother. She's a representative of a larger mindset. So what she was trying to say was that she could not conceive that such texts written in English language or even translated could be actually considered literature. It is this discipline of gender studies and its combination with literary studies that resulted in such texts being a part of the syllabus. And that is what brought in many women's texts into the English syllabus, much to the dismay of many parents. And this dismay continues even now, not just 10 years back, because just last year at a PTA meeting, a very uh, anxious, I understand her completely, a very unnerved mother, uh, very candidly told us, confessed that feminism is all fine, but uh, my daughter needs to get married too, you know. So uh, they find that feminism and marriage can be at loggerheads. It may not go together. At least there she is. So far, she's right, I think. She's very instinctively, intuitively right. Or there have been instances in my classroom where the Dalit narratives created such a deep, searing impression that some students told me suddenly, they got up and said, but ma'am, these uh, practices are still being practiced in my home. And they went back home and started interrogating the castes practices within their own family, much to the uh, discontent of their own family setup. So in all these writings, you must have noticed many other things entered through these texts. What is that? What, is what was so subversive about these texts that we were doing in class? It was a different histories were coming in. Social experiences of subjugation, politics of revolt and resistance, psychological impact of trauma and violence. These things were completely overturning the notion of what is literature all about. What is literature? We can, we can no longer define it in very easy terms. So what you find in the 20th and 21st centuries is that literature stops being an Arnoldian, you know, Arnold, I mean, Matthew Arnold, 
vehicle to transmit lasting human values. The very word human, as you know, is being subject to close questioning today. Post-COVID literary studies will change its shape once again. I'm sure about that. Drawing in more from our near apocalyptic life experiences today. So coming back to the certain basics of interdisciplinarity, it's simply put, it involves two areas of learning, involving or joining two or more disciplines or branches of learning. The very fact that this topic has been considered vital to this induction program indicates its centrality in literary studies today. And it's not just in language departments. We find almost all disciplines reaching out to others for a fuller, holistic development of itself. I'm sure you all must have taken a look at the syllabus, which is a, your syllabus, I mean. It's a perfect testimony to the changes that have taken place, reshaping the contours of English studies today. You must have glimpsed elements of interdisciplinarity either in the material being taught or in the background reading. You find philosophy there. I, I went through the syllabus. I asked Johnson sir, for a copy of the syllabus and I found much to my uh, excitement. There was philosophy, there was sociology, there was history figuring in the reading list, which I, I, uh, we could not have imagined you know, when we did our BA or MA even. And in cultural studies, you find explicit mention of this interdisciplinary approach. And in other papers, Maybe there is no interdisciplinary paper, it's not mentioned so clearly, but the spirit of interdisciplinarity is woven into the content. That's what many scholars, many academics have called, there's the overt interdisciplinarity, there's the covert interdisciplinarity. For instance, take a look at your literary criticism, you will find a psychoanalytic criticism. You will find a post-colonial criticism. This is all, the, the, you will see black criticism. You will see feminist criticism. It is all, they, they're all imprints of interdisciplinarity. Now, along with the papers on fiction, poetry, and drama emerging from England and English-speaking countries, you had a series of subjects which have, would have been taboo or anathema at least 20 years back. Cinema, theater, performance, media, etc. would not have found this space earlier. Okay, what I find is that it is not just a blend of literature and cinema or literature and theater. But cinema itself becomes an elective. I noticed that. And with Dr. Rajesh James around, I don't, I'm not very surprised by that. But understanding cinema itself becomes an elective. In my own department, I have students increasingly turning towards films, advertisements, and social media, and social media narratives or folklore to do their dissertations on. So which would naturally prompt a student to disciplines like sociology and history and psychology also. Uh, you cannot, you know, ignore them while you're taking up something like a social media behavior. It's a part, uh, many students have done their dissertation on Facebook behavior, uh, the Facebook communication. Naturally, you will have to go to media theories. You cannot keep them away. Though many uh, scholars, many academicians have found this copula, you know what I mean by copula? Literature and media. This and, they say, is very problematic. We'll see that later. Even the UG courses today, actually, it won't be much of a surprise to you because even the UG courses have diversified their content today. Many of you who, who are participating in this uh, course would have already got some grounding in film studies because that's what I find in my students. They already come with a smattering of knowledge. So it's very easy to build upon that, whether it's film studies or women's writing, etc. Mostly the PG programs are an advancement on that foundation that's already built. Now, interdisciplinary is often, or interdisciplinarity is often seen as a buzzword through which the colonial hangover of the superiority of English is got rid of. And a new self-reflexivity within the dis discipline develops, resulting in an examination of how this discipline serves to perpetuate certain hierarchies while also serving to liberate many from the shackles of orthodoxy or slavery. We stop seeing language as a mode of communication alone. Gone are the days when people joined English language and literature to speak good English. You can still speak good English, but what is good English will be engaged with in a very critical manner. We see language as an ideological tool used by systems of power down the ages 
to various kinds of manipulations. It has opened up immense possibilities for students of all disciplines. We find historians today dwelling more on literary texts and literary critics spending their interpretative energies on historical narratives. Textuality of history and science, for that matter, has led to an opening up of so-called objective knowledge to sharp critical inquiry. People like Hayden White have told us that the tropes used in historical chronicles, the gaps and absences in these texts, the play of metaphors in science writing, usually we associate metaphors with poetry, but we use it in science also, reveal many deep structures of thought and feeling, to quote Raymond Williams, activating these narratives. Semiotics, a branch of linguistics, which we call a science of science, is being used to analyze the kind of publicity campaigns, the media blitzkrieg, so to speak, unleashed by politicians. It could be a politician of any color, for that matter. Uh, not just one brand of politicians alone. They're all using it. The manipulative techniques and political maneuvering of different forms of media. Semiotics has become an important tool in the hands of media researchers. These kinds of studies are being engaged, not just as an ac academic exercise, mind you, but to unpack the ways they construct meanings which determine our ways of life and thought considerably. And when we look at the genealogy of interdisciplinarity in our universities, we also learn, as I told you earlier, that each country or academic community has its own history. India will have its own trajectory. I still remember how, when in my MA, even in an enlightened, so-called enlightened place like JNU, we had a paper called Life, Literature and Thought, 19th Century. It was a very exciting life, literature and thought, 19th century England. Not a single woman author, mind you. Isn't it ironical? Because that was a century in which no, women novelists bloomed in England. That was a major absence. And when did Ambedkar find a place in the syllabus of Indian English literature? Very recently. What I'm trying to point out is that when did women's writing enter into the academy? When did Dalit writing enter into the university? That's the point of intersection between the street and the university and the academy. Now, this is there's nothing new in it. It's a very ancient truth. Somewhere along the way, we lost track of it. The street, the village, the remotest forest or the sea or the wave, the remotest wave in the sea have always been part of the academic world. An example which I never tire of repeating to my students is a famous anecdote which is a part of the folklore around none other than the ancient thinker Aristotle. You know, it is often said uh, that the Greek ruler, who was ruling at the time of Aristotle, had given standing instructions to the hunters and the fishermen far and wide to report when they sighted a strange animal or a sea creature, they were to report not to the king, but to Aristotle. As Aristotle, this interdisciplinary being, was at work classifying all the species in that planet known as it was then. I always wonder, you know, could there be anybody more interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary than Aristotle? And yet say that interdisciplinarity is something very new. It's funny, isn't it? Because look at the range of writings of Aristotle, from logic, metaphysics, philosophy of mind, through ethics, political theory, aesthetics, and rhetoric, and into such primarily non-philosophical fields as empirical biology, where he excelled the detailed plant and animal observation and description. And it's very interesting, sometimes which I always tell my students in the MA first semester class, because very often I begin with Plato and Aristotle in my, you know, that particular paper on literary criticism and theory. So I always say at this moment in Calicut University, in almost all MA first semester classes, across board, across disciplines, students will be doing a little bit of Aristotle. From mathematicians, mathematics students, to science students, to law students, to history students, to political science students, to literature students, we'll all be encountering Aristotle. And 
What could be more interdisciplinary than this? A man is cutting across disciplines. But Aristotle had, had no idea that he was being interdisciplinary, by the way. He, he, he was doing something very natural, you know. So a point that I've always mulled over is this. Uh, the movement of a knowledge production and learning process from disciplinarity to interdisciplinarity need not be seen as a linear narrative. Perhaps Aristotle and Plato are the best examples of scholars who worked across disciplines. And no one saw that as an anomaly. In the 19th century, the thrust on special... Okay, okay all right. Uh, so uh, what I was trying to say is that any Shakespearean text or a Miltonic poem or that poem, a, a poetry by Emily Dickinson, they could all be, uh, <coughs> sorry, inflected by the dynamics of a Renaissance politics, a Puritan revolution, and the gendered ellipses and erasures of a 19th century America. Now, you may well ask, what is so new about this? Did not we always regard literature as an important historical source? To know more about the age of that particular poet or writer? We aren't we so habituated to answering questions in our question papers like what does a novel by Dickens tell you about French Revolution? I re I'm referring to Tale of Two Cities. Or a work like Pride and Prejudice, what does it tell you about the late 18th century condition of women or the status of marriage, etc., etc.? But here, it's important to distinguish between old historicism and new historicism. I already told you that history made its entry back through interdisciplinarity into literature. It is this new history that made its way back into it. Many theoreticians point out that interdisciplinarity, as I already told you, it was a revolt against formalism, where the text was seen as autotonic, autonomous, and self-contained. This revolt opened the doors to history again, entering the portals, bringing in the context. But history entered with a difference. The concept of history and context had itself undergone a fundamental shift. History was no longer a set of facts which coalesced to form a fixed context. It was a series of narratives, interpretations, texts, or what we today call cortex. Cortex that did not form a neat, unified whole, but revealed discontinuities, gaps, fissures in their making, where meanings were provisional, fluid, and constantly shifting in the light of new ideas, new questions, new insights. And the new questions challenged the very notion of literary canon. Along with history and sociology enters orality, or perhaps I should say it re-enters, because literature had its origins in orality. It adds a com no, orality comes back through gender studies, through black women's writing, through tribal narratives, through an alternate ecological, through ecology. How? Oh? It's because of the orality coming that you have a fragmented speech of an unlettered, phenomenal black woman like Sojourner Truth in your syllabus. I'm not saying particularly in the syllabus, but in many literary syllabi. It's because of this ecological consciousness that the speech of Chief Seattle uh, enters into this of, uh, of very unreliable veracity that too, enters into our syllabi, expanding the notions of authenticity, voice and text. Political movements and literary studies have always complemented each other in very creative ways. A new consciousness generates a new language, a different form, a distinctive expression, a refreshing aesthetic experience. We see this in movements organized around questions of race, gender, art and sexuality, caste and sexuality. Complex formal experiments can be seen in the poems of an Amiri Baraka, in the novels of Alice Walker, in the poetry of Nam Dio Dhazal or S. Joseph from Kerala, stories by Bama, C. Ayyapin, self-narratives of Ejjanu or a Nalini Jamila, or the stories of Perumal Murugan. A new impetus was given to interdisciplinarity with the social movements in the last half of the 20th century impacting the universe. Sorry? impact in the university. The black movements, the Dalit movement, the feminist movement, the green movement, all the indigenous people's movements, they all alerted we academics to the formation of new experiences and new histories, which should be addressed within the university disciplines. We have more academic activists now in these times who have become sensitive to the inequities within the academic institution also, 
and try to recti rectify them armed with these new sensitivities. Now, you might have noticed that the names of the authors I mentioned above, many of them are read in translation. Many works are taught in translation today, which is nothing new, is it? We, we read Homer, Virgin, Bible in translation. Yeah, there, there are universities which teach Homer, Virgil, and Bible in their undergraduate courses. Delhi University is one. European fiction and world drama is taught in translation. But we never address the cultural politics of translation. Forget about the cultural politics of translation. We don't even know who the translators are of all the works that we do. We, we would learn Kalidasa, Sabitnyana, Shakuntalam in translation. But if anybody asks you who translated it, you know, we may fumble and falter. We wouldn't remember. So we, now, but now we are aware of the ideological power of translations in literary and cultural movements and how they impact the process of translation. We realize that translation also works as a weapon for the marginalized to unite and talk to each other. Translation studies itself has become a very important part of literary studies, drawing into its fold disciplines like linguistics, sociology, and politics. Next, literature holds hands with cinema, theater, and many other arts in many departments or, or areas of research. There is much to applaud here as more possibilities open up. But I would like to record some reservation to here because today's generation of students gravitate to cinema or any visual text for that matter, or visual narrative. And now it may be web series. Now it's going to be more of online uh, you know, uh, performances uh, in a very natural and organic manner. Uh, actually, it's a visual generation because they have grown up on television and not primarily books. There might be exceptions. I'm not denying that. Reading takes, but generally speaking, reading takes a back seat today. I know that you had a lecture by Professor Harry Aaron on the importance of reading, but reading is by and large, it is taking a back seat today. We watch more easily than we read. Perhaps visual literacy may be excellent among you, but in literature, we still deal with books. And sometimes what I find is that watching a film becomes a substitute to reading. Film and the book are becoming interchangeable. Uh, you, you may take a few days to read a book, and so some of the students think it's easy to watch a film. But what are they doing? They're not watching a film either. They're just getting at the story. In that process, you get to know the story, but you miss out on the book and the film at the same time. This has nothing to do with literature, the interdisciplinarity, okay? This is just purely convenience. I'm just making use of this platform just to tell you this too. Film and the book are becoming interchangeable. This is a sorry distortion of the spirit of interdisciplinarity. This not only me, many academics have pointed this out. This is what I meant when I earlier said that the and, the literature and cinema, uh, what happens when these two things come together? Does literature appropriate cinema more and for, uh, lose out on the many uh, you know, nuances of cinema? Literature is just taking the cinema into its fold and reading cinema like you read a book. This is a very sad situation. What we need to understand is that a book and a film are two different kinds of texts addressing two different kinds of receivers. They are two different grammars, they are two different vocabularies. These receivers and spectators may overlap, but the art and industry of cinema is different. I'm using this example. Art and industry of cinema is different from that of the literary market. They may overlap, but there, is, there are distinctions. There's a dilution of attention paid to the specificities of each discipline, even as the literature departments make an effort to offer a separate paper on cinema as such. So a film, a painting, a musical composition or performance based on a book is not the book itself. So that's what uh, this, uh, there's this uh, academician from Washington University, her name is Sarah Van Denberg, who says that uh, very often she, she talks about this in a slightly skeptical manner. Uh, she's critical about this trend. She says, I quote, she says, rather than collaborate as equals, we too often appropriate the other discipline on our own terms, subjecting it to our needs. We distort it by using those elements we choose and disregarding the field. 
for instance, literature uses cinema in its own way, but are you really alert to the minutest developments and changes that are taking place in the field of cinema? Is, uh, uh, is cinema really being addressed seriously? Is something that is being questioned. Same goes for whether it is psychoanalysis and literature, religion and literature. In everything, there is a privileging of one discipline and the subjugation of the other. This is a problem that many have pointed out. All said and done, when we go interdisciplinary, it adds to the joy of learning, it transgresses boundaries, but it also opens different challenges. When we yoke together two disciplines, we also have a responsibility to familiarize ourselves with the basic features, objectives, and tools of each discipline. For instance, I mean, I already told you about the history of cinema. It can be same, the same thing can be said of research in English departments blending literature and environmental issues or the research related to medical humanities, which is all, these are all cutting edge areas, right? But are we, one question that we have to constantly ask ourselves is that, are we really methodologically equipped to carry this out? This is something we need to address ourselves because uh, as a senior academician, I've been in this field for too long, so now I get PhD thesis from various universities, and sometimes it is appalling uh, to find a literature scholar at the PhD level foraying into the area of folklore, of cults, into the area of religious studies, into sociology, without being familiar with any of the tools used in the discipline of sociology or religion to process data that you collect. Uh, so that is uh, very, very difficult to come to terms with. That undermines the seriousness of research, seriousness of a study, and the quality of the output will be very dismal, will be very average. Uh, so if you want to, and it would, you know, that kind of research does not contribute much to the already existing knowledge of a society. This is uh, very important because as PG students, I presume that many of you also want to build upon this and forge ahead, uh, you know, with uh, honing your tools of research uh, capacity also. So that is why I am cautioning uh, about this particular aspect. Uh, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity should not be a fancy indulgence, but a meticulous, rigorous attention to the production of a more sensitive knowledge and understanding. Uh, to conclude, uh, it's not possible here. This is a very tentative conclusion. I would like to quote an academician uh, whose name is Vincent Leach, who has written extensively in this area. He makes a distinction between modern and postmodern interdisciplinarity. That it sort of shows that interdisciplinarity itself is constantly changing. I quote from him. It's a slightly long quote, uh, so you may have to be a little alert to uh, get the uh, nuances. Uh, whereas modern interdisciplinarity dreams of the end of disciplines with their awful jargon and fallacious divisions of knowledge, the newer postmodern interdisciplinarity respects difference and heterogeneity, proliferating several dozen new interdisciplines, such as black studies, women's studies, media studies, cultural studies, post-colonial studies, science studies, disability studies, body studies, cure studies, etc. Significantly, these fields directly challenge modern humanistic objectivity and the idea of university as a serene ivory tower, organized and disengaged. They struggle against the hegemonic order have activist roots, engage in community outreach of a political sort. Yet, still and all, they submit to modern disciplinarity, its requirements, standards, certifications. You have exercises, you have internal assessment exams, exams, uh, supervision, certain norms to be followed, attendance to be meted out, all these things are there. So it's a mixed phenomenon, postmodern interdisciplinarity. And uh, with that, I conclude by saying that this is not a conclusion. The conversation continues. Thank you all. I hope I made some sense. I don't know, because this is a rather, I'm still yes, getting used to the platform of the webinar.
so I'm not very sure whether I have been, you know, successful in communicating. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. It okay. was a very uh, engaging session. And uh, okay. now the floor is open. Uh, I hope uh, there will be questions uh, regarding the topic which you are talking about. And uh, now the, the audience can speak now. They can raise their questions either unmuting. Uh, yeah, the first question has been asked by uh, ma'am, can we uh, uh, have a question answer session right now? Yeah, we can. I mean, oh, I think okay. there's already somebody has uh, written something. Yes, in yes, yes. Malaviga, I am Naya has raised a question. And uh, do you think that the interdisciplinarity enriches and fills the void in a work, thereby giving it more dimensions even without the knowledge of the author? I hope uh, you can see that. Question. Yeah, I can, I can, I can. I'm just trying to figure out. Uh, do you mm -hmm. think that interdisciplinarity enriches and fills the void in a work, thereby giving it more? Of course, I mean, the author uh, doesn't matter at all, Malavika. Uh, it's the, our duty is to read it in a very productive manner and uh, give it, uh, give the work dimensions uh, which uh, relate to us. Because what the author, uh, author, uh, author's intention does is no longer. It's not that it's not relevant, but uh, it need not be relevant, isn't it? The, we can, if we can see meanings in a text, if we can invest in a text in a much different manner, much more enriching manner, why not? It's perfectly uh, permissible and it should be done. Make it connect to our own realities. That's what interdisciplinary readings do, approaches do. I'm, I don't know whether I, if I have answered your question. Is, is that what you wanted me to uh, address? Have I understood your question, Malavika? Yeah. OK, yes. thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. So if you have any other questions, uh, you can uh, either you can ask directly or you can post it on the message part. Uh, Thank you, Malavika. I don't know whether. Uh, uh, Janagi, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, yes, Rajesh. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, please. Since, yeah, since you were uh, you know, talking about uh, the recent uh, styles of uh, interdisciplinarity research which is happening in the academy as well as among the students. So, uh, what I feel is that, uh, you know, uh, we are living in a particular academic atmosphere, as you said before. We don't know how to use the possibilities of interdisciplinarity, right? So for the sake of uh, freshness, for the sake of new researchers, we, we, we adopt certain topics. And uh, and I would say that I can't completely, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, put critiques on the students or researchers alone, because our academy also works in that level, right? So in our search for the newness, we automatically jump to history, we automatically jump to sociology, and the sudden uh, coming of philosophy, especially in the name of theory, has, I think, has created, uh, of course, it has opened our discipline, but on the other hand, it has also made some sort of, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, 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 some sort of, uh, uh, what do you call, refocus, or what do you call, uh, maybe, yeah, uh, re it has de 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 directed our uh, focus. Right? I, I know, I understand that perfectly, because there is this, uh, uh, you know, rush, or, um, for rush behind novelty. And uh, I am also, uh, as you rightly pointed out, Rajesh, I, am, I also have my reservations. And I'm also pretty skeptical about it. Sometimes we stretch it so far that we lose the rigor that is necessary in the research, you know? Uh, because without even knowing about the field properly, we just appropriate. That's precisely what many academicians are pointing out. Uh, we, in, you know, I have seen scholars, researchers, uh, doing work um, straddling medical science and uh, the narratives emerging out of it like for instance illness narratives you know people are, who are going through certain diseases they are uh, they produce their own autobiographies and they look into that uh, fine you can look at it as an autobiography you can use the narratological techniques and all that it's fine but i think and uh, uh, um, we also need to be self-critical. How much do we know? I mean, why are they being? That is something which we never address. Why are these narratives being encouraged by a particular market? You know, there were people, people, 
had certain terminal diseases even earlier. Then they never wrote their uh, experiences. They were not sold. But now there is a huge market for this. Uh, so what is it about uh, this, you know, that uh, creates a market and you sell them and we do dissertations on them. And we don't, we don't address this market, but we do this dissertation saying that it's a new area. We also have to see the kind of material conditions that pressure us to produce certain kinds of research. Uh, that is one aspect. The other aspect is that the formal, uh, you know, a kind of a methodological training that one person requires to do certain kinds of uh, research. Uh, for example, there is, uh, you, you must have seen the new, uh, the book that we often follow in most of our uh, departments, Research Methods in English Studies, which we all teach, I think, I'm sure we all, the Gabriel Griffin and one more person who have edited that book. And uh, we are teaching that as a part of the coursework. They have included interviews, as, or, or interviews as a part of, uh, uh, you know, English Studies research, which were not a part of our research quite some time back. Okay, you bring it in. But how do you bring this into a, uh, into a work uh, that is based on discourse analysis? How do, you, how do you deal with that? You cannot deal with the interviews. You cannot read those interviews like a sociologist does. You have to have a different kind of tools, you know, research tools to interpret them. We are not bothered about that. We just go ahead and do what we think a sociologist always also does. But then the sociologist would do it better than us. So then shouldn't we be training differently, getting, you know, uh, uh, tra training ourselves or evolving certain techniques differently? Our research should offer something different from what a sociologist is offering, right? Otherwise, uh, literature and sociology departments can merge and do. That is why Dr. Robert Pippin said this may eliminate certain faculty positions, you know. There will be nobody to teach English and the literary uh, study. There will be people doing, everybody will be doing sociological work without knowing anything about sociological tools of analysis. And this is a, this is a very critical situation, actually. And we have to, we have to sit and think about how to, uh, I think this whole academic community, students, teachers, research scholars, everybody will have to sit down and think about it a little deeply. Because we are in a hurry to follow whatever the Western universities do. You know, we are just following it a little blindly also, I feel, sometimes. I'm also interdisciplinarity. It has done a lot. It has made the boundaries between disciplines porous and permeable. We reach out and learn a lot from each other. Definitely, all that is great. But there are certain times when certain crises emerge, but we never address them. We gloss over them. We try to move ahead. And uh, that is why very uh, uh, below average work comes out in the form of thesis, PhD thesis, from even very, very privileged, prestigious universities, mind you. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking from personal experience, that's why. I don't want to name the university or anything, but I have gone through certain uh, dissertations, which I, I, I was stunned, uh, you know. Uh, so in the name of uh, progressive politics, <laughs> many things, uh, research is getting diluted and that doesn't uh, help the pro politics much, you know, when you do that kind of work. It's actually self-defeating. This is something which we need to think about. Uh, I don't know if I, I mean, Rajesh, I don't have an answer to yes, this. Yes, yes. I'm sharing your concerns, actually. Yeah. That's good. I think there are a couple of questions here uh, which I would like to, in the chat box, Rajesh. Uh, this one, Ashita Raj. More about the dissertation that are created around social media platforms, uh, like the factors which are taken into account or the common areas. Uh, uh, Ashita, I don't know whether I've understood your question uh, well, but I can say that one was that the Facebook, uh, again, uh, you know, my students, they, these are all MA dissertations, by the way, and uh, some of the students were looking at uh, Facebook behavior and how it uh, leads to depression. And again, you know, psychology, Facebook, social media, and looking at narratives, all these things came together. But since it was an MA dissertation, and when students have just been initiated into the process of research, we encourage them to do that, because they would have just freshly done cultural studies. And they are in a great excitement to use all the theories they learned there, you know. Uh, so we don't want to uh, discourage them, uh, you know, douse those flames, but they do. But they've done a reasonably good work. But when you're going entering a PhD with that kind of a topic, you will have to examine yourself and see how ready you are for that. 
uh, and again, uh, I think many people are looking at how women are coming out on social media very boldly. So the gendered behavior on Facebook has become a very important topic of study. Politics and Facebook has become a very important uh, area of study, again, because particularly when uh, you know, very organized campaigns are being conducted by the political parties themselves. We just recently read that uh, some of the parties are actually, uh, they have a whole cell for social media <laughs> organized campaign, you know, to hike up the likes in a particular manner and all that. So uh, all those Facebook likes don't be deceived by them. They are all orchestrated. I, I hope you see a film like Social Dilemma. You will know very soon, uh, very fast, what's happening on the other side. Uh, so that is Ashita. I don't know whether I've answered your question completely. Uh, then Sri Ja, the interdisciplinary, isn't there a possibility of the scholars privileging one discipline over the others? Is that a concern? Definitely, Sri Ja. That was the concern that I was articulating a couple of minutes back. There is. And it is not just a stray concern, it's a very well articulated theoretical position by many professors. You know, uh, yeah, Tom C. Thomas, can any discipline afford to be non disciplinary? No. Don't you think that's high time the literary studies acknowledge this to, uh, to hard sciences? Um, well, uh, yes, I think literary studies have acknowledged it in ever so many ways, but at the same time, we cannot really collaborate with hard sciences right now, I think. That would be a little too much. Literature and physics? <laughs> Do you think our students will be able to take on that? Sociology than the Patinilla, Maria the K, little than physics, okay, boy, and Aga Prashna will Tomsa. I don't know. Uh, I'm just wondering, hard sciences? Yes, uh, science writing itself has become an important part so, of literature syllabus. Yes, Tomsa. Uh, science, science, uh, may, may, I, may I interrupt you? or, or Please, please, please. It's been. Hmm? So yes. sciences, as we generally understand, are branches of the same same tree of knowledge, right? So how can we uh, uh, attribute anathema, or how can we approach a particular discipline with uh, untouchability or things like that? So we have to embrace all branches of discipline that humankind has developed as the branch of the same tree. So we have to heavily draw on uh, the repertoire of knowledge from hard sciences at the micro level analysis of literary texts uh, well no harm in doing it at, at all if you can do it uh, that's my assumption no no tom uh, tom sir i perfectly but whether how far is it possible how the question is how far yeah, is it possible? Uh, your that's apprehension that's is all right i'm admitted. trying to address that uh, it is not equal. yeah it's not very easily possible in the university system or any education system but if you are a very very dedicated committed uh, researcher you cannot afford to ignore uh, the, the the enormous influence of uh, hard sciences in literary studies nowadays. That is my uh, assumption. Thank you for your response. Uh, I have not responded yet. I have something to respond to that. I completely agree with you. Uh, a person, there is no anathema here at all, Tom, sir. If that person is qualified to collaborate, uh, you know, uh, to work collaboratively uh, between literature and uh, hard science, perfect. But does that person have the expertise in hard science is a very important question. That's what I'm asking. He has to draw on incessantly from uh, them. Yeah, to, to, to draw on that, to, please let me complete. To draw on hard science, you have to understand it, right? To understand of course, that. Of course, please, of course there should me, be more of collaboration. Allow, allow me to complete, sir. To draw on a hard science like physics or mathematics at a very high level, you need to be well versed in the in that particular field of scholarship. No Otherwise, matter. how can you do it at the PhD level? You cannot do it. If you are a mathematician, if you have, if you have done, let me tell you, if you have done an MSc in mathematics and you're going to do, if you have done an MA in English also, perfect. You can do. You can offer a paper on literature and mathematics. No doubt about that. We have philosophers like Wittgenstein, who were mathematicians as well as philosophers in yeah, philosophy. And, en and engineers as well, right. Yeah, in that area, it's perfectly possible. But then there are philosophers who have no, don't have any idea about mathematics. We have Newton, who wrote Principia Mathematica, and uh, you know, which has many philosophical implications. 
definitely there are philosophy there are uh, madam i am i am, I am the question was raised because of my fear that there is still an academic casteism existing in in disciplinaries disciplines in the in universities uh, something yeah. of an untouchability something of a, of a gap eh? it's high time that we have pulled down all the all the all the fences and bulwarks that separate these entities as separate they are not separate disciplines at very close quarter analysis of the disciplines they are not separate at all it's, a, it's a, after all about a life uh, life which is composed of energy energy that is uh, that is prevalent in ever so many ways in our universe right so we have to be deep as as you said in the beginning early part of your talk uh, your interdisciplinarity has to be more uh, deep disciplinarity and uh, depth uh, psychology you know depth uh, dimension um or definitely calls for the welcoming knowledge in other it, it is not possible all on a sudden you have to associate with the scientists you have to uh, seek uh, knowledge in um, very many uh, uh, sensitive areas of uh, uh, emotional writings and things like that uh, it is not a water dead compartment at all in my assumption that's my humble suggestion and some submission it is very challenging definitely that is exactly the spirit of interdisciplinarity sir i don't have any difference of opinion with you there but my problem and the problem that has been articulated by many theoreticians is that we don't do this with sufficient expertise we you should draw on hard sciences you should draw on all kinds of fields of knowledge and enrich literature and lit literature should enrich sciences also but right. we need to have a basic expertise if we, also in those if we don't have expertise, expertise we should borrow expertise from them we should not isolate ourselves in our ivory towers of uh, literature that reading. was the, that was the burden of my talk also sir i don't yeah, know yeah yeah that's it. It so i i was i was uh, um, the, i was annoyed to ask you this question because you mentioned the word the depth dimension of uh, interdisciplinarity you know in the in the early part of your talk you might remember that it, it and the depth calls for such uh, such such an intervention from my part yeah uh, right absolutely. i agree with you sir yeah yeah there's no there's no difference of opinion there i was just qualifying whatever i had said i'm okay. sorry if i if i provoked you right <laughs> no you why should you provoke me when you are agreeing with me <laughs> you are not disagreeing with me at all so what should i, I, I be we are agreeing but <laughs> Okay, thank you. Welcome. Any other questions that I have not answered? Ma'am, I think uh, uh, you know you rightly pointed out that it is perhaps with the 18th or 19th century, or even a little before that, uh, the specializations came and uh, <coughs> the Aristotelian or the pre-Aristotelian Aristotelian period. You know, where we had uh, only one discipline, which is philosophy, which was you know where the the, the writers or you know the people who were learned it. You know they had a knowledge in physics, chemistry, astronomy, philosophy, mathematics, and so on. So uh, there was no disciplinary barriers or distinction. Perhaps it all happened uh, uh, in the in the 18th and later in the 19th uh, with the super specializations. Uh, otherwise, uh, as you mentioned, uh, it was a kind of a holistic education that we had uh, in the in the Socratic and the pre particularly in the Socratic and the pre-Socratic period. Uh, take for example any of the philosophers Anaximenes or Anaximander or you know the you know uh, the other the uh, Pythagoras or any other philosophers uh, even Plato Aristotle and so on you know we had only uh, one discipline which is basically called uh, philosophy isn't it sorry yeah I am not very sure whether we, the discipline was called only philosophy because uh, uh, Plato, I, I agree with you by and large, but uh, on this point, uh, I think when Plato in his Republic, he talks about three, uh, three uh, subjects that are to be taught to the philosopher, that is music, uh, poetry, and gymnastics, if I remember correctly. So these were the gymnastics for physical instruction. The physical fitness was a very important part of the Greek uh, training or curriculum. So it was music, gymnastics, and poetry. And of course, he has problems with poetry, which we all know through his, uh, you know, those chapters in the Republic. Uh, but as you rightly point out, but you know, one thing is that we are, and even my talk was predominantly addressing the Western university system. 
which we have also inherited through our colonial experience. And uh, recently, I happened to come across uh, uh, articles on the Indian university system, Indian uh, knowledge system, Indian traditions of epistemology uh, regarding interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, etc. So the thing is that uh, we are not really looking at other learning systems, histories of learning, not only Indian. I mean, there are learning systems in various countries. We are talking only about this particular university system. Maybe it is high, this university system already has many problems. And maybe there were learning traditions, uh, traditions of knowledge acquisition, uh, conventions of knowledge acquisition, which followed a very different kind of framework and perspective. I talked about this because we are speaking in the uh, you know, framework of the English department, and we are generally dealing with this English tradition and the Western intellectual framework. So I was. Uh, and within 45 minutes, this is all that I could manage to do. Uh, so that is why. But let me say my talk, my talk is not at all exhaustive. Okay, It has got larger ramifications, many more uh, areas that we need to examine uh, for a more comprehensive understanding of this issue of interdisciplinarity. We are also have to look at other cultures, which we have not touched, actually, to be very frank. And very often from many other cultural locations, the criticism is that this Western system of epistemology, Western system of knowledge acquisition, the Western methods of university education are itself flawed, separating you know, disciplines, putting them into compartments, as Tom uh, earlier pointed about these watertight compartments. And it is this particular this, uh, discrete systems of thought which don't link. That has led to our atomized kind of an understanding about life planet, ecosystem, etc. So uh, it is these boundaries that need to be, and apparently there are traditions of knowledge which never did this, which had a holistic understanding about life, different knowledge systems, and their linkages. So one, we need to be self-critical also at this juncture about that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, adding, to, adding to that, uh, you, know, you mentioned uh, it is the super specialization which is the cause of ecological catastrophe. Yeah. And do you think uh, the emerging environmental humanities uh, can uh, somehow compensate for that? To a certain extent, yes. We have become alive uh, to the kind of ecological dimensions and how it should be integrated into this and all that. I think the conversation has begun. And that conversation is very—it's a little too late. <laughs> we should have begun it much earlier, which was too late. Uh, and today, it's, isn't it a very sorry state that in our environmental humanities, uh, you know, there are people who are activists and who are people concerned individuals outside the university. This is very important for us to know that they build up the knowledge and we appropriate them and we start using them as texts and we study and we teach. Degrees are given. They do PhD thesis, but nothing changes outside the university. Life continues to be as ever as, uh, as much as ever, sunken, you know, waste. It's a wasteland out there. So uh, there is this, uh, there is this uh, very uh, cynical attitude of many people out there. They say that okay, we do all these grassroots level struggle. We build up alternate knowledges. You people in the universities, you you are careerists. You appropriate all this knowledge, you work on this, you produce doctoral dis dissertations, you become associate professors, professors, and all vice chancellors and all that. The system continues in its own way. Life goes on being a mess in the other way. Nothing substantial is happening outside the academy. You understand? So there is this, uh, there, there are people who feel that the moment it becomes a subject in the university, you're killing it. <laughs> you know? So that is also there. I, I have to voice these cynicism also because we need to be self-critical. Just because we make it into a subject of study, it does, of course, it has its importance. We are sensitizing the students. Actually, very many of my students did not know many things, you know, many primary things, till they started dealing with the texts, or certain texts. Like, for instance, Ambikasudan Mangal in the Enmakaje in the Varnaya novel, which has been translated as Swarga by J. Devika. If, uh, it is being used as a textbook in many places, that's what I heard. It's after confronting the text that many people knew, that, uh, of course, they had heard of endosulfan and the movement and all that, but the terrible effects of that particular pesticide, which is an indication of our concept of development, you know, a modern development, that is something which you know, many students do not even know at such, in such sharp ways. And so that was a great contribution. You get a certain sense of satisfaction when the people, when students come to you and tell you that, my, this was a huge revelation to us and it has sensitized us. 
at least that much. That's a modicum of change that we are able to make in academia. We hope so that these students will go back to society and disseminate this information. The change will, it's not going to be a massive change, but change at very micro level in a very small, small ways. I think even the smallest gesture of change is important today. So uh, that is what I feel about that. Uh, in between, there was another question, and Arvind has questioning for Ms. Sharon Narayanan, which I'm really keen to answer. Definitely, there are immense possibilities of collaboration, Sharanya. Um, actually, as a matter of fact, it's very interesting. I feel extremely happy to see this. I myself am slowly going, getting into that area, not for any particular academic achievement, because I love music and I love literature too. And I'm trying to see the crossovers between these uh, two disciplines right now. Uh, so it is definitely possible. And I see a lot of uh, uh, websites uh, out there, you know, dealing with these areas. Yes, uh, ma'am. Ma'am, I have a uh, you know suggestion. In fact, uh, I, I I would like to respond to that particular question. Yeah. Like the connection between literature and music. I I would like to uh, suggest a very interesting book by Tejaswini Niranjana, which is called Musicophilia in Mumbai. You yes, might have read yes. it. I know. I know. Uh, I know. Is, yeah, yeah. 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 That would be a very interesting book. Yes. How definitely. literature, cultural studies, and music they all go together. Definitely. Definitely. I agree with yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, just give me a minute. My laptop uh, battery is running a little low. I just have to plug it in. So just give me some time to join. You can continue to ask questions, okay? No problem. I'm just plugging it in. Johnson, sir. Uh, yes, are there any more questions? Uh, Rajesh, uh, I don't see any more questions here. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I'll wind up the. Oh, yes, Francis, sir, please. Oh. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I was just wondering if you were you were talking about the subjects that were taught in the um, in the medieval uh, times or even before that. Yes, sir, I was wondering if you were actually referring to uh, the concept of trivium, trivium and quadrivium. You know, trivium consisted of rhetoric, grammar, and logic, and uh, yes, quadrivium yes. consisted of music, astronomy, algebra, and geometry. Yes. Were you actually referring to that? I, I was just wondering. Uh, sir, can you just repeat the question? There was some problem. With no, it was not a question. It yeah. was not a question. You were, earlier you were mentioning about the, uh, you know, somebody mentioned about, um, and I think Johnson sir mentioned about philosophy being the only subject that yeah, existed. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, you happen to mention that there were not just philosophy, there were rhetoric, I mean, there were things like music. Yeah, uh, yeah I think I, I did say that music, uh, at least yeah. what, there were many subjects that were taught. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, and there, as you said, rhetoric was a very important part of it. Yes. Yeah. 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 And uh, I think uh, the 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 medieval the trivium, you know, it was called trivium, rhetoric, yeah. grammar, and logic. Yes. Yes. And that was uh, one concept, and the other concept was uh, quadrivium, which consisted of music, astronomy, algebra, and geometry. Now, those yes. were the things, I suppose, you were yeah. actually. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But uh, actually, what I think uh, Johnson said on. I don't, I don't remember who was saying it. What they were trying to point out was that they were all seen as connected intrinsically. You know, They were not separate right. disciplines. Yeah. They were all yeah. seen as a part of a larger whole. Mm -hmm. this, was, this is the difference that came up when these things became disciplines. Then it became, right. they were all, they, uh, all working in isolation. It is this right. problem that uh, I think many of them were uh, indicated. Right. Thank you, sir. That, thank you so much. That's right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rajesh, I hope this is now 820. Maybe uh, if there are no questions, we can uh, wind up. There was yet another question. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, let me just ask you. Uh, Ms. Sharanya Narayanan, how ethical is to subject texts such as rape narratives to academic scrutiny? Uh, 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 Sharanya, that's a very loaded question. Uh, ethics depends upon what you want to do with them. 
you know, uh, actually, yeah, rape discourse, rape narratives have been, I think uh, they should be addressed. Uh, they should be, uh, they definitely become part of the gender studies. Uh, but uh, ethics depends upon the way you go about it. Uh, and are you going to, uh, you know, how do you, uh, but there's no way you can ensure, you know, how do you, what is the kind of uh, uh, conclusion that you come to from that? Uh, we cannot, uh, the, you can do with the same data, you can do different kinds of research. Actually, when uh, this takes me to a, a documentary that was taken by, I forget the lady's name, uh, oh, I forget. It was soon after Nirbhaya, uh, that incident happened. Um, this lady came to do a, a, a documentary, and I consider documentary a research work in itself. Uh, she interviewed um, the culprits, actually. And there was a lot of commotion regarding why should you talk to the culprits when it should be victim-centered. Uh, and the ethics was questioned. But I think it is very important, I personally think it's very important to talk to the accused. Because that shows the notions of masculinity. That's under, it became a very, uh, later on that, uh, that material that she, uh, uh, you know, was able to create through those interviews, they become very important uh, sources for masculinity studies in the country. So uh, it's very important. For instance, we are still trying to come to terms with the Hatras, uh, you know, incident in India that happened two days back. So many narratives are coming out. It is important to look at it in a very, very rigorous, critical manner. We cannot shy away from them. Now, ethics is something else, what you do with it. But I think, as earlier many people pointed out here, all Okay, all right. Uh, I'm sorry, can you, am I visible or audible, whatever? Hello? Yes, Ms. Yeah, yes. Yeah, you're, in, you're between, audible. in between, I lost the connection, so I was trying to reconnect. That's what happened. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I think I lost the thread of what I was saying. Yeah, I think in spite of all the ethical concerns you are raising, it is important to have uh, research in those areas because without the research we will not get new insights or new perspectives into it have i answered the question i'm not sure hello hello yes ma'am yeah, yes, yeah. Ma yes. Uh, there is another question out here is it possible that there are any downsides to interdisciplinary research is it difficult to establish relationship between various disciplines? No, that is our task. It is difficult. It cannot be very easy, <laughs> definitely. But we have to find areas of you know, collaboration, where we can collaborate. That is a challenge. That is a responsibility, burden of responsibility falls on the researcher. You have to develop your own methods. You will have to, definitely, it's not going to be easy at all. It is difficult, but you have to, we have to measure up to it if you want to do something very interesting in that particular area. I would uh, suggest that you take a look at uh, Catherine Belsey's book, you know, whoever is interested. Uh, there is this uh, textual, uh, textual analysis. Uh, there's this book called Research Methods in English Studies in which Catherine Belsey is a very important literary critic. She has this beautiful essay called Textual Analysis. Uh, which becomes a part of uh, 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 and she, how she uses new historicism and textual analysis in close quarters, where she looks at a painting of uh, 12th or 13th century, and, and it's a rape. By the way, somebody asked me a question about rape. She's looking at the politics of rape through a painting and how it is important in uh, you know determining certain very basic gender sensibilities and the political implications of the gender sensibilities in Europe.
Okay, uh, there is another question here. Same division happens everywhere. We used to have general doctors. Yes, uh, I agree. Yeah, that's true. In the medical field, uh, uh, Sandra Sebastian, can you suggest a few ways to connect literature and the architecture? Uh, well, I think Sandra, we should be talking to each other. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. one on one, because literature and architecture, there are plenty of ways you can connect. There are so, there's so much of so much in the way you write about architecture, it's literature, right? Uh, you find city studies becoming a very important part of literary studies today. Uh, when you look at uh, the city spaces, how the spaces are organized. Uh, if you, you hate it, I think this hated by no, Michel Serto's book, uh, which looks at the way, see, everything is a text today. So even Taj Mahal becomes a text. Uh, 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 postmodern building, it becomes a text. The, the way the buildings are constructed, how spaces are allotted in that particular building to various kinds of people that enter. There is an hierarchy within architecture, it is gendered. So, space, place, architecture, etc., very much linked. It's very much a part of cultural studies. Uh, people like Edward Soja, who talks about the politics of space, or John Bachelard. These are the things, who, these are people who talk about. Uh, actually, uh, even before we started talking about literature and architecture, such concerns had already become part of particularly women's writing. I still remember my teacher long back, uh, she was uh, actually discussing a book by Doris Lessing, and she talked about the way rooms and the space within the rooms, how it is gendered. You know, how rooms, doors, thresholds, windows, they all become part of a woman's world and a man's world in different ways. I still, I, it was so many years back, but those uh, moments when she talked about it still very deep in my mind. So the Gothic architecture, can you really dissociate Gothic architecture and Gothic novel? Wuthering Heights is all about that. So Sandra, you are very much there. There are so many ways. Because architecture of a particular period is very much linked to the basic mindset of that period also, to a great extent. Dr. Sajo Jos, uh, philosophy is the apex body of all the branches of knowledge. We speak of the philosophy of music, philosophy of literature, philosophy of science, etc. Uh, but isn't philosophy already a separate discipline? Dr. Sajo Jose, if you're around, I'm a little confused by that question. Uh, we have philosophy of literature, but philosophy is already there as a I didn't get you there. I, it's a bit, audio is a little uh, blurred out there. Let me mute. Not yet audible. Not yet audible. Okay. Uh, yeah, you, uh, you, we are audible, but you are not. Uh, yeah, still there is an issue. Okay. So I think there is a connectivity issue. Uh, yeah, yeah. Problems. I can't hear properly. I love it. So Johnson, sir, uh, sh shall we go for some more questions, or uh, is it the time to wind up the session? What do you think, Johnson? Sir? If there are questions, if there are questions, we can take. Okay. We'll... Okay. You know, I, uh, Dr. Sajjo, Joe, sir, uh, I, I can't hear you properly, but one thing I would like to respond is that if you say something like philosophy need not be set apart, philosophy teachers and students will be really angry with us because as it is, it is an endangered discipline. But, <laughs> but philosophy is very important, I think. It's very important. Though because, uh, so there are certain aspects of philosophy which you need to be professionally trained to uh, uh, address them. Philosophy which is different from philosophy as such, you know, which covers a lot of things. 
logic, mathematics. So statistics also becomes part of philosophy to a great extent, I believe. That's what I heard from certain corners. So uh, philosophy, we need to have philosophy as a separate discipline. It's very important. I feel that. Any other questions? If there aren't any more, Johnson, sir, I think. Yeah, uh, Rajesh, uh, we can we can. Uh, yes, uh, respected Johnson, sir, and uh, respected speaker, uh, Janagi Ma'am. Uh, uh, it was really an engaging session. In fact, uh, I would say that uh, the the notion of interdisciplinarity is such a relevant topic. In fact, I myself, when I started my research in 2011, you know, I came up with a topic in film studies. Then, of course, I was approaching film studies from the background of uh, literature or philosophy. But only when I started journeying into the topic, uh, I came across the what do you call the, the methodology of film study, right? In that sense, I had to study, uh, you know, what you call the aesthetics of film first. Then only I could apply uh, certain literary theories. And uh, I face the same issue uh, with when I work on documentaries or when I uh, work on cast and cinema, etc. So I have this, uh, what do you call, problem as well as, as well as it's also an opportunity to look into the discipline, to understand the nuances of the uh, topic and uh, I'm so happy that uh, I could do my research in uh, Calicut University in the sense that I had a, a chance to do uh, research in film studies in 2011. It would seem as if, uh, you know, Tom Sir was trying to say doing research in film studies in, in literature department was a kind of an anathema. It was a wrong choice. And I got a kind of an advice from many, uh, you know, teachers and, th you know, uh, what do you call philosophers or uh, maybe theorists from from uh, across from Kerala, right? But somehow I could stick on to that and I could complete. And uh, you have been a very strong support and uh, influence. And thank you so much for coming here. And I would say that you are the right person uh, to talk about interdisciplinarity. In fact, when I was doing my research, I could uh, see some reactions from some of your students uh, who could actually listen to your class where you talked about uh, uh, Dalit studies, Bhama, uh, transgender issues. In fact, when I screened my documentary there, of course, uh, we had a discussion on, on transgender issue. In fact, from that period onwards, I was experiencing what it means to be uh, a student of uh, interdisciplinarity right, uh, in, in your department. And thank you so much for coming here, sharing your very uh, scholarly, not just uh, what you call, uh, very deep as to call to you, right, uh, very scholarly, deep observations about uh, uh, interdisciplinarity as well as you're also trying to uh, scheme out certain problems of uh, what do you call it, certain trends in our uh, research as well as in our academia, especially students taking uh, what do you call certain topics like film studies without knowing the basics of uh, film studies and its aesthetics, right? So that is a big problem. That's a big challenge, right? You know. Even now, I have the same issue when the students come with uh, research on film study, they come up with uh, applying psychoanalysis and, you know, without any knowledge in, in analyzing the text proper. So thank you so much, uh, ma'am, for coming here and uh, sharing your perspectives. Uh, it was really a, a, what do you call, a memorable experience for all of us. And uh, I extend, uh, you know, the departments as well as the colleges heartfelt thank you to you. And also, uh, I would like to uh, share my big thank you to all the participants and also those who have asked questions. I think uh, we planned it almost like one hour session, but it's almost extended up to one, <laughs> one hour and 40 minutes. I think yeah. it's a very good sign that things are rather, uh, you know, going very well, right? It was really an engaging session, enlightening session, relevant also, very, very relevant. And thank you, department. Thank you, Arvind, sir. And thank you, Johnson, sir, for organizing it. Yeah, can I and, say uh, a lot of thanks to Rajesh? Thanks for the opportunity for being able to uh, listen to uh, all of you. And thanks for the lovely feedback, which I will definitely factor in when I think about this topic more, you know. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes. Um, hey, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Rajesh. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, thank you, Preeti. I saw the comment there. Thanks uh, thank a lot. Thank you, members from other colleges.
uh, students. Uh, tomorrow uh, is our uh, last session in the series, uh, in the orientation program. Uh, we'll be here at uh, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, with uh, Professor uh, Sanjay Mukherjee tomorrow. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Sir. Don't see.